if your internet signal is good, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. All right, we are live now letting people tune in. So I'll give it about 30 seconds before we get started just to let everybody uh, log on. I think we're live on Facebook as well. Well, we're going to go ahead and kick things off here for the, the season finale of season three. Um, we do have some more webinars that we're going to have coming up with Christine Jones here in about two weeks. And Keith and I have talked a little bit about uh, the next two weeks about Keith and Dale coming on to do just kind of a general Q&A and answer your guys' questions. So be looking for that uh, to come here in the next either next week or the week after that. Uh, as well as Dr. Christine Jones's four-week series. But this is going to wrap up the current series that we're on. We've got a guest on here this evening to talk about cover crop economics. So I'm not going to spoil uh, Keith's intro for um, our presenter, but I will just kind of kick things off, letting you guys know that everybody is muted. If you have questions or anything during the presentation, we're going to go Till about 6.15 with the presentation, and then we'll get to your audience questions at 6.15 and do about 15 minutes of that and conclude at 6.30. Um, with that, Keith, do you want to go ahead and introduce our speaker? Yeah, thanks, Noah, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Rob Meyer. Uh, Rob is with the University of Missouri, and he's also uh, the director of the North Central Region of SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education. And that's actually how uh, Rob and I got to know each other. Uh, we started Green Cover Seed in, in part because we did a SARE grant uh, back in 2008. We applied for one of the small farm and rancher SARE grants because we wanted to see how much moisture cover crops were taking. And so we got this small grant, got a little bit of money to buy some moisture sensing equipment, uh, and did the, the, that series of experiments in 2008 where we planted all the different cover crops and put the moisture sensors in. And, and Rob, little did we know, you know, the impact that that would have, you know, not only on, on us and, uh, and on SARE, because, you know, we've, we've been able to leverage that, you know, in a lot of different conversations and a lot of different studies have referenced some of that uh, stuff that we've done. So that's how I got to know Rob back in 2008 through the SARE program. Uh, and I really enjoyed getting to know him over the years, uh, speaking at similar events, uh, being on speaker panels at a lot of different places. Uh, he's just he's just about as knowledgeable as a guy you're ever going to find. And what better topic, you know, to close our season with in economics, because, you know, cover crops are great, you know, building up soil health and, and that that's all super excellent. But if we can't make money doing it, you know, that making money, being profitable is the ultimate in being sustainable. And so it has to go together. And so Rob's got some great information uh, from, from different surveys, from different studies that they've done uh, on economics. And one other thing that I do want to uh, mention about uh, Rob and I's relationship over the years is another connection point that we have uh, is that uh, several years ago, uh, Rob kind of led a charge to make a uh, uh, soil health documentary. Uh, it's called the uh, Living Soil, uh, Living Soil Film. I'll post a link to it in the chat here in just a little bit. Uh, but Rob just told me that thing's been viewed 2.2 million times now. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you have not seen it, uh, you, you really should uh, do it. It's certainly worth an hour of your time. Uh, it features our farm. It, it probably many of you have seen the very famous video of my air seeder coming unhooked from the tractor as I'm driving down the road and it comes unhooked and it goes into the ditch. Well, that that was that was filmed in the making of this. So uh, we can't say that no air seeders were harmed in the filming of that because <laughs> one of them was. But it all ended up well. But it's it's a great piece of of, of film work and is actually Rob's daughter was the the producer and the director. Uh, the filmmaker of it and did an excellent job. So I'll post the link. Uh, and if you haven't seen that, I would highly encourage it. So Rob, with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can give just a, any additional background and then take it away. 
Sounds great, Keith. Well, yes, it's been wonderful to get to know you over the years and see all the amazing things your company is doing. Um, I tell people I first got started with cover crops at a very young age uh, on our family farm in central Illinois. Uh, we had cover crops through the 1960s. And I still remember as a boy, my dad pointing over to uh, one of our cornfields and saying, well, look how that corn looks better where we had cover crops two years ago than the corn next to it. And you could see it then. And, uh, but like so many farms, once wheat left our system, we also took cover crops out of the rotation. So by the time I was a teenager, we weren't doing cover crops anymore, but the memory of that stayed with me. And I started doing work on cover crops in the early 1990s and have uh, worked with them most of the last 30 years. So I was asked to visit with you a little bit today about the economic aspects of cover crops. And although my particular background is more on the agronomy side, I did minor in ag econ, I like to say so. Um, but more than that, just I guess because of my farm background, I recognize if you're gonna do practices in agriculture and learn this from my dad, you better show that they can pay. And so uh, we undertook a big effort uh, with some economists and others um, and work with a lot of advisors from across the country to look at farmer data we had from surveys and other information to see what we could learn about what do cover crops really do to the bottom economic line with corn and soybean production. So I'm gonna walk you through some of what we learned. There is a report that's available if you wanted to see more details on what I'll be presenting. I think uh, Keith or Noah will put that in the chat box, the link for that. That's a free publication you can order copies of or you can just read it online. This was released in the summer of 2019 and it's based on five years of data from uh, the National SARE CTIC cover crop survey plus other data that was available. We have a lot of farmer examples in the uh, publication. It's, it's very much a publication for farmers and farm advisors. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to make you aware that that uh, resource is available to read online or, or request a print copy of. So of course, when we talk about cover crops, the first thing that often comes into mind is the cost of doing the seeding. And as I think probably all of you are well aware, there's a wide range of seed prices. <clears throat> Keith and Noah could tell you, you know, depending on whether you're doing legumes in their mixes or just a straight uh, cereal grain, you're going to have a wide range of prices. Uh, we also know that there can be differences in the way that the seed is planted. Um, on our own family farm, uh, our two tenants uh, both do tend to put the cover crop on with fertilizer in the fall. So they don't really have any extra costs because they're out there fertilizing anyway. Uh, and in their case, they don't have any termination costs because they normally do a burn down spray with, with glyphosate. So in the case of our study based on national survey data, and this goes back to some early survey data, we assumed a median cost for seed of $25 an acre. Now, some of you that are using cover crops probably are doing it for less than that, especially if you're just using cereal rye. I know of, of farmers that are, are doing it for as little as 10 or $15 in seed, but uh, we wanted to be fair to what we'd seen in the survey data, which included, by the way, um, some horticulture users as well as corn and soybean growers. Uh, we do know that cover crop seeding can be done less expensively, again, depending on species. Uh, seeding rate, uh, I find with cereal rye, for example, there are people that put on 70 or 80 pounds an acre. There are people that put on 20 or 30 pounds an acre, depending on what their goals are. Uh, seeding method can certainly make a big difference. This is the Rulon farm in Indiana, and uh, I was there for a tour of some of their cover crop work. They, they do cover crops on about 5,000 acres. And they said, well, they use airplanes, they use grain drills, but their preferred method is to use their, their big row crop planter because they can get over a lot of acres in a hurry and that keeps their cost of seeding down. And then of course the cost, the seed source can make a difference as well. But for purposes of this analysis, we assumed an average cost of $37 an acre. And again, your cost might be considerably less than that. Or if you're doing a complex mix and doing some grazing, your cost might be a little higher than that. So what are the returns with the cover crops? This is the part that gets a little trickier, right? To decide what's going on. First of all, is there any yield impact? So we're gonna look at some data on that. Are there any lower cost with using the cover crops? And then greater resiliency. And, and we'll end up with that piece because in some ways that's the most interesting aspect of what happens that can really pay off economically. 
So at the time we did this uh, survey, the data we had from national farmer data um, was from this uh, 2012 to 2016 period. 2012, of course, you all remember was our major drought. And interestingly, in that year, corn and soybeans responded very well following cover crops. Uh, soybeans were slightly better than corn, but both around 10% yield advantage following cover crops versus no cover crops. So this is data from farmers who had both fields with covers and fields without. Uh, and we asked them to only report their yield data if they had comparable management, about the same planting date, um, same varieties of corn or soybeans and so on. So in subsequent years, the yield difference is not as large, a little bit more for soybeans tending to be around three to 4% for soybeans, about two to 3% for corn. But again, just kind of keep in mind in that drought year, a much bigger yield advantage. We'll talk more about that later. So one thing we did was we dove into that data and that was about 500 farms a year, by the way, providing that data. So a really large data set from a lot of different states in terms of corn and soybean yield impact. Probably not surprisingly to you, one thing we saw very clearly is that the longer farmers used cover crops, the more of a yield increase they saw. Now, definitely there were farmers the first year they used a cover crop that had a yield loss, especially if they were doing corn after CRI and maybe didn't adjust their nitrogen management. But in general, on average, uh, there was a positive trend uh, and it just picked up year over year. Now, what we don't know is, is there a big difference from five years of cover cropping versus 10? I would say there's probably, you know, continues to be some uh, improvement, but uh, we were able to look at about uh, seven years of data and saw a continued trend over that time. So I'm just going to kind of, to simplify this, break it down into one, three, and five-year impacts of cover cropping. And what we saw with the data, specifically looking at the 2015 and 16 growing seasons, which were fairly normal weather years over the, most of the Corn Belt, with about 500 farmers each of those years, we, we had, in those years, we had good data on how long the farmers have been cover cropping. So if they've been cover cropping for a year, just a year, uh, not a whole lot of impact on the corn on average. Now, again, there were some that lost yield, some that had a little more of a yield bump, but on average, you know, just barely any difference. Soybeans was a little bit more uh, positive, about 2% in that first year. But then as we go through the years, we start to gradually see more of an impact. And again, not dramatic differences, only 3% after five years of corn about 5% in soybeans. And again, this is in relatively normal weather years. I showed you that data for 2012 and how there was more of about a 10% on average difference that year. So what does that mean in terms of yield for baseline returns? So we factored in uh, those cost of seeding that I showed you, and then just a very small amount of adjustment after a few years and fertilizer and herbicide costs, uh, particularly uh, in case of uh, uh, corn, a slight uh, fertilizer savings on nitrogen by the fifth year, and then with soybeans, a little bit of herbicide savings, but not much and none at all in year one. So you do see in year one some cost to doing the cover cropping. That's not going to be a surprise to anybody listening to this webinar. Maybe one of the interesting things was, uh, we looked at this really extensively, that on average, and I want to emphasize that average part, it took about three years to break even uh, with cover cropping. And then after five years, we're definitely making money with cover crop. And get into that fourth and fifth year, uh, the returns are positive. And then in, in theory, they're going to continue to be positive indefinitely after that. So what about that first year or two, though? You know, there's some expense to doing it. Is it really worth it to dive into this? Maybe you're already cover cropping, but maybe you've got a neighbor or a, a relative that's kind of asking that question. Well, I want to tell you a little bit more about these baseline assumptions, and then we'll get into some more specifics overall. So for soybeans, we were at that time in, in the summer of 2019, assuming that uh, really spring of 2019, that the soybean prices were an average of $9 a bushel. And we looked at an average bushel per acre of 60, corn 350 a bushel and 200 bushels an acre. Uh, again, for both of those crops, we were assuming a very tiny amount for reduced expenses with erosion repair. That would be if you had a situation where you had to go out and smooth out some gullies or do some other uh, repair to erosion areas. Be beginning in year three, but not year one, we recorded a small savings in weed control cost uh, 
And then with fertilizer, uh, no change for soybeans in year one. The only change in year three and five, based on some of the farmer data we saw, was a very slight savings in phosphorus and um, bumping that up just slightly to 20 pounds an acre in year five. So a small savings in, in phosphorus. For corn, again, no change in fertilizer in year one. And then some modest reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus as the soil health builds. Uh, so you can see some of those numbers there. Now, I wanna emphasize that there are a lot of farmers who use cover crops who do not change their fertilizer practices. They just stick with what they've been doing. On the other hand, there are farmers who've been cover cropping for several years that have made bigger changes in their fertility. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So just using these, these baseline numbers, like I showed you a minute ago, again, some cost here in year one, breaking even in year three. So how do we think about that? Maybe you're talking to a neighbor or somebody else who's kind of wondering about, should I do cover crops? And they're saying, well, it's gonna cost me money if I go out and do it this year. And that's probably true in most situations. Well, I would tell you probably that neighbor of yours or, or family member is uh, willing to invest in lime. And it's pretty rare that lime will pay off in one year. Usually we talk about that taking two to three years, right? How about uh, those equipment purchases that we all make on farms, whether it's new or used equipment, you know, you've got to pencil that out. How long is it going to take for that to pay back? It's certainly not going to be in one year in almost any case when we talk about equipment. So we do need to think multi-year. That's part of the story uh, that I want to emphasize. But I also want to talk about how different management scenarios may affect cover crop economic returns. Because I told you what we looked at to this point was averages. So no farm is average, right? You've all got different circumstances. Um, some of you have got cattle, some of you've got particular weed issues, some of you've got compaction. So we really spent a lot of time in this uh, analysis effort looking at if you've got particular management issues you're dealing with, what does that do to cover crop economics? So I'm gonna walk you through seven specific scenarios, some of which may apply to your farm, and what that might do to when the cover crops would pay off for you. So the first thing I want to talk about is herbicide resistant weeds. You know, these have been showing up everywhere. I can't believe it. I drive all over the Midwest for my work. Uh, and I know many of you are seeing this in your areas. Our family farm in Illinois is starting to see some of these herbicide resistant weeds. And it's just a, a really big problem. You go further south, you know, even with modern chemistry, sometimes they're not able to even harvest the crop because these get so bad. Well, we found with doing our analysis that uh, with certain average assumptions based on data that was out there, that there would be about an average extra herbicide savings of $27 an acre. Now it could be more or less than that, obviously, but that that would allow cover crops to pay off in year two for corn. And actually in the very first year, of soybean use if you had this herbicide resistant weed situation and if you're able to cut back on some herbicide expenses that you would otherwise have. And our report goes into the details of those assumptions behind each of these. Uh, I'm gonna just outline them briefly. Uh, so in this case, we said if the herbicide resistant weeds were a problem, there could be some cost of control go up. Now we didn't assume any grain dockage or anything like that. We do know that often there's an extra post-emerge herbicide application or a more expensive residual uh, chemistry. So what we assumed was that there was a $12 savings on doing one fewer post-emerge spray. Now you may be saying, well, I only do one spray anyway, but I will tell you like on our farm where we've had some of these herbicide resistant weeds in the past, uh, our farmers had started doing two sprays. Now the good news is since they've started cover cropping, they've been able to go back to doing just one spray. So in their case, yes, they had that savings on a second spray. One of our tenants um, who's been doing cover crops for longer now, uh, he actually has found that in about probably two out of the last three years, he's also been able to not use a residual uh, product in his soybean field. So that's giving him some savings. In this case, we just assumed that we could use a little lower cost there. So those savings again added up to about $27 an acre. So herbicide resistant weeds is one scenario you might have that would allow those cover crops to pay more quickly. How about compacted soils? Um, many of you probably experienced really wet weather in 2019. 
and uh, whether it was the spring or harvest period and uh, you know we've all seen fields like this what's our normal solution go out there with a big piece of equipment right try to uh, deal with that compaction through tillage well there's a cost to doing that of course it takes labor it takes fuel it takes the equipment that breaks down to an average of about $15 an acre and if you're not subsoiling and using cover crops which actually have been found to be more effective on many soils for dealing with compaction than deep tillage. Uh, Ohio State did a, a five-year study on that and showed the cover crops had the advantage. Uh, you'll get some savings there that makes the cover crops pay off in year two for soybeans and break even in year two for corn. So again, it pushes that planting horizon up a little bit if you've got that problem. What about fertility? I mentioned earlier that could be a factor. Let's say you've just rented a field that's been, you know, kind of not managed very well. Uh, you've taken on this field and it just, you know, it hasn't had P and K put onto it or, you know, the organic matter has been depleted. But what about that situation? Well, if you've got that and you've got a situation where the cover crops can help with fertility, that too can speed up the payoff. If the cover crops can break even a little more quickly for corn, two years instead of three. But for soybeans, we felt the difference was marginal and still looking at about a three year uh, break even point. So what we were looking at here <clears throat> was a very modest savings for soybeans, slight reduction in phosphorus beyond what we assumed in our baseline and then an extra 10 pounds of uh, potassium savings. For corn, uh, we assume we might have some legumes in there and get a very modest nitrogen credit of 40 pounds. Now, some of our legume cover crops can give much more nitrogen than that if we let them grow long enough. But usually there's the trade-off, right? We wanna get the corn planted instead of letting the cover crops grow another few weeks. So um, if, if you're organic, you might let that uh, clover or other legume grow long enough to get over 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But for many farmers, they're gonna be terminating earlier. So some modest savings, but it does add up. Now, this was an interesting scenario. Um, I'd been hearing for years, as some of you probably have, that when you convert to no-till, you're gonna take potential, potential yield bump uh, in many farms, depending on soil type. So that probably comes about on many of our soils because I, as I just said, compaction can be an issue. Uh, we don't have some of the uh, nutrient dynamics worked out when we immediately switch to no-till. So we get that yield dip and you know it's just it, it holds people back from doing no-till but what we're learning is if you start with a cover crop let's say you plant cereal rye in the fall and then you no-till soybeans into it the next spring as your first no-till step well you can it depends on the soil type again but you can avoid that yield dip and when you put those two together you get some nice economic savings because uh, you don't have those tillage operations. You've got less labor, less fuel. You do have the cover crop seed cost, but this starts to make things pay off in year two for corn. And you can actually even break even in year one for soybeans. If you do that, start with cereal rye, go to no-till soybeans. And again, this is an average. Uh, it's going to vary by field and situation. So what we're assuming here, we're avoiding that normal yield dip with no-till by doing the cover crop with it, that cover crop's helping with reduced compaction, better nutrient availability, improved rainfall infiltration. We've eliminated some tillage operations, such as a fall chisel operation, a couple seedbed prep passes. So we've got some savings there. How about grazing? Uh, I know Keith every day is probably talking to farmers about grazing options <laughs> with cover crops and green cover seeds done <clears throat> a great job serving farmer needs with that. I, I think anybody that's familiar with this would tell you that the number one way to make cover crops pay for themselves is to use them effectively in grazing. And we see here some uh, high tensile electric fencing, uh, doing it in a management intensive way where the cattle are moved frequently really helps the economics. The low cost fence makes it affordable to do. You of course got to think about a watering system, but let's look at this for a little further detail. So. There's a lot of ways you can evaluate uh, grazing and cover crops. You can look at the rate of gain in the cattle. We chose to look at a hay replacement model. And I'm gonna show you the details of that, but the bottom line number was an average return of about $49 an acre for grazing. So that makes grazing pay off in year one if you've already got some electric fencing and if you've got access to a water source. Now, if you've got to pay for those two investments, then yes, it could take two or maybe even three years 
to make that grazing system work, but boy, it can be very profitable in the long run. Now, this hay replacement model was himself and grazes cover crops himself, so he definitely knew what he was doing, and he used pretty conservative numbers, but here were his assumptions, that the cereal rye was generating about 1,500 pounds of dry matter per acre. That's a pretty low number. Rye can do more than that if you let it grow long enough. He assumed about 50% of the rye biomass would actually be lost from poof action and selective grazing, so we're only using half that. That 750 pounds of rye that is used is replacing the equivalent of about uh, a little over a thousand pounds of hay because we're assuming that 78% of the hay is utilized and it has 88% dry weight. So that's how those numbers balance out. He assumed at that time in 2019 that the hay was valued at $80 a ton. And he assumed an additional modest savings of a little over $5 per acre for reduced machinery, fuel, and labor from not hauling the hay. Uh, so when you put all those things together, you get the $49 an acre. Now, again, that's a relatively conservative number. I've, I've seen other studies that show profitability of over $100 an acre. But of course, you can lose money, too, if you um, don't have a real efficient system set up. And again, we're assuming that you've already got the electric fencing and you've got some access to water. If you've got to invest in those, it's going to take longer, of course, to pay off. OK, I'm getting down to the last couple of scenarios here. Um, you're all aware that there are cover crop incentives available, but you maybe haven't seen the rates in your state. Uh, I will tell you that the way NRCS sets their environmental quality incentive program or EQIP rates uh, is at the state level, and they can change from year to year. So these numbers are from two years ago. Uh, just show you a kind of a range of states. You can see Illinois is higher than Iowa. I've looked at every state in the U.S., and most of the states are at about $50 an acre or more, but there are a few in the $30 or $40 range. Now, that's the basic rate if you're using a single species. If you use two or more species, every state will give you a little bump. Usually, it's five, six dollars an acre, something like that. And then there's a higher rate if you fall into a certain category. Maybe you're a beginning farmer. Uh, maybe you're doing some other uh, special situations. So even the bottom line here uh, with many of these states is that if you had at least um, $32 or, <clears throat> excuse me, got to get the button out of my way here so I can see the number, <laughs> $33 an acre, the cover crops will pay off in year one. Uh, so just keep in mind, I've heard people say, well, it's a hassle to go to the NRCS office. You know, you can go in there, depending on the number of acres you're doing, and very quickly walk away with it. Cover crops are costing you $37 an acre that first year, but you're getting back 50 or more dollars an acre. Well, then you're making an extra $14 an acre. Okay, last point is dealing with managing soil moisture. And this gets at what I showed you with the 2012 data when we had um, such a big impact on yields after drought. So you may have seen a rainfall simulator like this, but if not, what we're looking at here is some pans that have been lifted intact from different uh, field situations. So this is obviously a tilled field here, second from left. Got a cover crop milk mix species here in the middle. Uh, got a no-till field right next to it. This is a pasture area here. And then an inch of rain is applied in a relatively short amount of time from an overhead sprinkler. And uh, they can watch whether the water runs off that pan of soil, it's slightly angled, or whether it soaks through. So you can see the tilled soil, actually it's running mostly off here. It's going into the front jar. Whereas we look at the cover crop soil, you can see it's going into the back jar. So there's some holes in the bottom of these aluminum pans and or tin pans, and it's not running off the cover crop field. And I've seen this on our own farm after a big rain. Uh, you just don't see any soil coming off. The water's clear uh, and it's infiltrating well. Uh, but I saw this the first time and I thought, well, that's, that's good, kind of makes sense. But this is what really sold me when I first saw this done several years ago. When you flip over those pans of soil, this one in the front is the tilled soil. And in the back is the cover crop soil. And you know, in all my years as an agronomist, I quite honestly had not really thought about the fact that rain might not soak into that tilled soil very well. And what we learned is in many of our soils, it kind of seals shut the clay particles 
uh, once it starts raining. Plus, there's no macropores, the channels created by earthworms and so on to help get those uh, rain, rainfall into the soil. So just think about that. If you're getting a big rain on a conventional field, probably having a lot of it run off and not soak in very well compared to a cover crop field with minimum uh, disturbance. And just to kind of look at that cover crop on the left, if you visualize that tilled field, you're getting, yes, a uniform upper layer here. Uh, and by the way, I've seen people do that uh, tray with the, stirring the soil with their hand right before they rain on it. What we want is those macropores created by the earthworms and the root channels as roots decay. And that allows that rain to get into the soil quickly and to penetrate deep into the depths. Plus we've got better aggregate structure. You can see kind of the aggregate soil particles here versus a situation where tillage has destroyed that aggregate structure. So that gives us better uh, storage capacity. And as we do these systems over time, of course, we get more organic matter that acts as a sponge to help hold some water in that root zone. So all those things work together to improve our soil moisture dynamics. But it's more than that. There's actually several other things that contribute to cover crops really helping in dry conditions. So depending on our cover crop, if we have a vigorous biomass, uh, this is rye, soybeans have been planted into, well, of course, that's going to reduce uh, evaporation from the soil. So we're going to retain what soil moisture we have longer into the season. It's going to keep those roots cooler, which helps. What about mycorrhizal fungi? You've probably been hearing about them. These are pretty amazing organisms in the soil that form kind of a symbiosis with the crop roots. And they effectively act to enlarge the amount of soil volume that our crop roots can access. So you think about a dry year, what's the problem? Well, the corn can't get to the water and nutrients because it's not going to grow through a dry soil. I've dug up a lot of roots and various uh, soil moisture tests, and they simply stop growing when they hit dry soil. Well, those fungi are better at kind of working their way deeper into the soil and exploring that soil volume for moisture and nutrients. And why would they give that moisture and nutrients to the corn roots? Well, the corn roots are exuding carbon. You may have heard Keith talk about underground carbon economy. And there's this interesting trading going on between the fungi and some bacteria with the crop roots uh, that helps that whole underground nutrient cycle work. So they play an amazing role, especially in a dry year, but at any time they're helpful. There's other things that can happen. In Missouri, where I'm at, we have a lot of soybeans after soybeans. We find that some of our cover crops like rye will root more deeply than the soybeans. So let's say the rye roots six inches deeper. Well, what happens if after we have that deep rooted cover crop, the cash crop will tend to follow those root channels of the cover crop down. So the soybeans may root another four to six inches deeper after a cover crop than they would have without one. So that helps in a dry year. So you put all those things together and there are even other dynamics that really pays off. And when we looked at what happened in the drought of 2012, with the extra returns of about $58 an acre on corn and 65 on soybeans, boy, those cover crops pay off right away year one. So you think about buying, let's say crop insurance, right? That takes a little while to pay off. Uh, it may be three years, five years, seven years before you get a crop insurance payment, maybe never. Well, same thing with cover crops, it may take two or three years before you have that year where the cover crop really pays off big, but it could easily pay for the expense of the cover crop once you have that bad year, whether it's a really dry year or even a really wet year. We saw in 2019, we had in the Midwest, 19 million acres that could not be planted at all. They were never planted for corn and soybeans in 2019. And we paid out as US taxpayers $4.2 billion for those 19 million acres of fields that could not be planted in crop insurance payments. So this is a field in Oklahoma that spring in 2019. This farmer uh, who sent me the photo on the left, cover crop no-till uh, field on the right is a conventional field, same soil type. Well, you can guess which field would be planted first, right? The cover crop no-till field. So think about trying to get in. We had farmers that year that didn't plant until July or even well late June for sure, some in early July. And uh, others, many others, the 19 million acres just took insurance because they didn't think they could plant in a timely fashion. So that was an example where that greater ability to get the, the water into the soil to um, deal with that extreme rainfall event, uh, the cover crops and no-till paid for themselves. One way that can work 
is just because of the transpiration of the cover crop in the spring. The cover crop can serve as a way to manage that excess moisture, most notably planting green. We found we were having more and more farmers planting green. Now this is kind of the extreme example of planting into about five foot tall, four or five foot tall cereal rye, soybeans in this case, but you could do it with a smaller cover crop, but that helps manage some of that moisture. So three takeaways, and then I'll be happy to have some discussion with folks. One is that when we're evaluating cover crop profitability, you really have to look at the big picture, right? How can we gain efficiency as part of that soil health improvements with the overall cropping system? So are we more efficient with our fertilizer? Are we more efficient with our weed control system? Are we doing a better job managing compaction? So when we put those things together, you start to see how this works. Secondly, just like buying uh, equipment or applying lime, we have to take a multi-year horizon. So this may make sense to you, but if you're talking to a neighbor that's skeptical, talk to them about it in the context of, of applying lime or buying equipment. I think that can help them think about how cover crops is kind of a multi-year investment. And then one of the most often cited economic the benefits of cover crops by experienced farmers is their impact on the resiliency of the cropping system. There was a report released earlier today by the Soil Health Institute, 97% of the 100 farmers they study that have been using soil health practices like cover crops and no-till said they had better ability to deal with resiliency in their system because of using those practices. So it's sort of like your investment in crop, federal crop insurance, right? That the premium you're paying for that cover crop is gonna really pay off big in some years, but not as much every year. So a few different ways to be thinking about uh, cover crop economics. So bottom line, I would say value those cover crops, both for their immediate benefits like weed control, uh, maybe for grazing, but also as an investment in the long-term success of the farm, dealing with those unusual weather events and having more resiliency for the operation. So again, more details in the bulletin if you want to grab that online and appreciate visiting with you this evening. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate that. Um, if you guys want to get in some of your questions here, I know that Keith has a couple here that he might get to to start. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, if you guys want to start typing your questions out, we'd be happy to take them. Rob, I, I just want to follow up on one of the last things that you said, because it's it's such an absolutely stunning number. Did you say 97% of the people in that Soil Health Institute said that cover crops made their systems more resilient? They said that for soil health practices, which in the case of their study was typically cover crops together with no-till. Some farmers just had cover crops, some just had no-till, but 97% of those farmers that they did detailed economic assessments on said that it improved their resiliency and compared that to 67% said they had yield improvement. So it was a pretty remarkable number that nearly all of them <laughs> said it was helping their resiliency. Wow, that's, that, that's really impressive. And that Soil Health Institute, there's gonna be a lot of information coming out on that. I know they're gonna have a whole series of webinars kind of targeted to individual states. And then my assumption is they'll release a lot of this information probably for publication after the webinars. Yeah, they already have a summary on their website and I just wrote down a couple numbers and they're very comparable to what I showed. So they showed for farmers have been doing this for like, uh, I, think, I think five years was their baseline. I'm not absolutely sure of that, but it was a multi-year use of these soil practices. They said for corn, there was a net profit improvement of $52 an acre. And for soybeans, it was just slightly less, $45 an acre. So that was, again, mostly farmers are doing both uh, cover crops and no-till. That's great. Um, a couple of other areas, and I think your report addresses these in a little bit of, uh, you know, it, it gives mention of them, but I just wanted your comments on uh, the ability for, for farmers who are doing some of these practices to capture additional income through eco, either a carbon market, ecosystem service market, or some sort of a corporate sustainability program. Are you seeing that increase? Are you seeing, the, you know, you get a lot of questions about that. What's your take on where that's going? Well, I focused on the incentives that are available from NRCS and I just showed EQIP. They also have the conservation stewardship program, but there are many private sector payments available depending on where you live. 
A lot of the uh, programs that have been rolled out are geographically targeted. I know there's some from General Mills in Kansas. Uh, there are others like with cotton in the southern states from Wrangler. Uh, but one of the broader ones in the Midwest recently was Bayer launched a program. Uh, of course, the company that used to be Monsanto, but Bayer has um, a program they started last fall that's paying $10 an acre to do either cover crops or no-till or strip-till if you haven't done that on a particular field before. And that's not as big as what NRCS is paying, but it's, uh, I guess, a pretty easy to sign up for a program. Mm -hmm. There's other groups like Indigo Ag and others that have been offering uh, soil carbon payments, and I'm expecting that to only increase uh, over the next year or two. There's so much discussion about that. And we may even see more federal payments related to soil carbon. Yeah, I know we just, uh, we had done a con soil health conference at our, our Kansas location down in Southeast Kansas. And uh, one of the things, one of the programs that we talked about that, you know, people that farm in that area, Eastern Kansas area would be eligible for No Tell on the Plains has a uh, is working with Unilever and uh, Country Croc on um, a, a essentially a cover crop incentive type program. And I know at the at the time they said, you know, there's still acres that can be signed up. So if you're in that eastern Kansas area, uh, you can contact us or you can contact the folks at No Till on the Plains. But Rob's right. There's there's a lot of programs. Iowa has some pretty good ones uh, that will give incentive payments to do some of this. And and I, we personally haven't been in an area that could take advantage of that, but my understanding is the sign-up requirements for these are far easier and far less uh, difficult to do than than like an NRCS program. Um, so don't not do it just because you think there's going to be a lot of paperwork. At least check that out uh, a little bit first. So, uh, Rob, did you look at any people that have been doing soil health practices, you know, for a long period of time, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. Has there been a study done on that and looked at the economic impact of that real long term um, instead of just, you know, the five to 10 year type thing? Yeah. Do, do the benefits keep getting better? <laughs> I wish I knew a definite answer to that. We did have some farmers in our survey that had been doing cover crops for 10 years or more, but we didn't have enough to kind of have a statistical evaluation of, of their impacts. I mean, it, it kind of looks like, you know, those benefits could kind of continue to improve. I think they probably slow down a little bit, but um, but certainly we've seen farmers that are doing cover crops and no-till in combination for let's say 20 years continue to uh, gradually build their soil organic matter and anytime we build organic matter we're going to have a more productive resilient soil so that alone should be a clue that uh, we're going to get some improved economic returns that are, are continuing to gradually improve now yes there might not be a dramatic change between your 10 and 20 but if it's an extra ten dollars an acre you know it all adds up so yeah, absolutely. Well, Noah, do you got a couple questions there in the Q&A box? Oops, you're on mute, Noah. You, you, you mistake. It's like I haven't done this for three seasons. You anymore. pulled the Dale. <laughs> <laughs> At least I caught myself before I got into an hour-long story. <laughs> Was there any yield difference from just a fall rye to a multi-species full season cover? Yeah, we didn't uh, have a chance to break that down because um, we didn't really know what cover crop species the farmers reporting on the yield data were using. Now we did in that same survey get um, data on the whole mix of cover crops the, the, the farmers were using on their farm, but the problem was we couldn't, let's say they used, they said they planted uh, 500 acres of rye and 100 acres of a mix. Well, we didn't know which field was correlating to the fields they were reporting yields on. So we could have guessed at it, but we didn't, since we didn't know for certain, we didn't want to try to break that down. I would say, you know, anecdotally, as probably many of the listeners know, um, the more biomass we have, especially if we've got a mixture of cover crops, uh, generally we're going to see some greater benefits. Now, rye is a kind of a unique case because um, if we have great growth of rye, that can be, as I said earlier, really helpful for something like herbicide resistant weeds. There's some studies showing that if you want to get suppression of palmer amaranth or 
uh, water hemp that you know you need a, a pretty good amount of biomass. I've seen even some people saying up to 8,000 pounds an acre. I think that kind of depends. But uh, whereas on the other hand, if you're doing rye before corn, well then a lot of rye biomass or a big rye crop can um, create more nitrogen challenges. So we can deal with that if we manage our nitrogen correctly, put on some extra nitrogen at planting time. Um, but uh, so it can, just kind of depends on the cropping system and, and timing of termination. Tim? Do many farmers direct sow after rotating with a cover crop if it's no-till? Otherwise, is the cover crop being tilled in? And then also, what is an average cost benefit in each of these techniques? Yeah, you know, farmers that are experienced with cover crops, I would say the vast majority are direct. Um, they're planting without any tillage into the cover crop. Now, they may be terminating it two or three weeks ahead of time. In other words, that cover crop is dead well before planting the corn or soybeans. Uh, but what we also see the longer farmers use cover crops, the more they tend to let that cover crop grow because they want to get the maximum benefits. So that's where we get the planting green scenario where the cover crop is still alive at the time the corn or soybeans are planted. Uh, as far as farmers that do till the cover crop in, we do see that on some organic farms. We see it on some vegetable farms. But uh, we did a, a survey this past year and had more um, horticulture producers. And we found that even among horticulture producers, if they were using cover crops, they were less likely to do tillage than conventional um, vegetable operations. So, Okay. Uh, what is the shortest amount of time you would consider necessary to make a cover crop worth planting? The shortest amount of time? Well, <laughs> I think it depends a little bit on the uh, cover crop species and the goal of using it. But let's say we're dealing with erosion. Um, I have a, a picture I show in some talks of, uh, that I was sent by a Michigan extension worker. And it shows rye that's, that's literally about maybe an inch and a half or two inches tall. And you wouldn't think, and it was not thick enough to make the field look green or anything. You, know, you could still see the soil very easily. But there was a photo of a conventional field next to the field of the rye. There was a tremendous amount of soil blowing off the conventional field and none at all off that rye. So in that case, just a little bit of growth was making all the difference to stop <clears throat> the wind erosion. We see some of the same things with water erosion. That it doesn't take too much to get that anchoring ability with the roots. On the other hand, we look at something like uh, radishes. Well. Um, if we only wanted to um, sequester a little nutrients in the fall, we might not need a huge amount of growth. If on the other hand, we're wanting to suppress something like mare's tail with the radishes, then we want that radish to get big enough to have leaves covering the soil. So it just kind of depends on the situation. But I'll tell you this, the bottom line is the longer we have living roots around the year, so even if it's just extending it from October to December, that's gonna help soil organisms stay alive for longer and uh, we'll have more earthworms, we'll have better fungi populations. And so that's gonna pay some dividends. So even a little bit of growth is a good thing. Yeah, no, I might I might chime in on that too, because I, I that, it's a great question, by the way, whoever asked that. And I heard someone ask that at a conference that we had where we had Dr. Christine Nichols um, speaking and they asked her that same question. And I thought her answer was, was quite interesting well, and she was approaching it because she's a microbiologist. She was approaching it from the rhizosphere and what are, what are those plants putting out for the microbiology? And, and she, what she said is she thought with 30 days of growth, you know, which 30 days of growth, you don't, you don't necessarily have a real big cover crop, but she said 30 days of growth. She felt like there was significant enough root exudates being put out by that young cover crop plant that at that point it became economically viable to where it would pay for the cost of the seed. Now, you know, maybe it doesn't pay for the cost of the seed and the seeding and the termination and all that, but, but she felt like, you know, you were getting enough benefits to, to at least cover the cost of the seed. And I think whoever asked that question to her was asking specifically about, you know, this time of the year, didn't get anything planted in the fall you know, I'm going to be planting corn and beans here in, in April or whatever is, you know, is it still worth going out and planting some oats and peas now? And uh, that was kind of the context of the question. And, and her answer was, uh, 
you know, strictly from a soil improvement through the root exudates and enhancing biology, uh, she felt like 30 days of growth uh, would, would be a kind of a, your break even. And then anything you get above that, you know, that's, that's just a bonus. Yeah, Keith, I've had some good success uh, seeding cover crops in the spring. Um, it, of course, depends on the species, but things like crimson clover or some more faster growing legumes, Austrian winter peas, and you said oats, you know, they'll put on a remarkable amount of growth in about six weeks. So if we can get them in, frost seed them or get them in at late March, uh, they, they can do some good things for us as we get into May. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any suggestions or experience with tropical cover crop species? I have. Um, you know, probably the one that's been the most looked at, at least, you know, around the U.S. is sun hemp uh, that comes to us from the tropics. It's kind of an interesting, tall, vigorous plant that seems pretty good. Uh, so we're some forage use. I'm sure, Keith, that you're selling it in some mixes. Um, kind of a a plant that was originally looked at in the U.S. for its fiber potential in the stems. And uh, so that's one. I've looked at uh, lab lab beans. Uh, they're being looked at, particularly in the southeastern U.S. They're a tropical legume, kind of a long vining runner type bean. Uh, for my area in Missouri, I've grown them several times. Um, they're okay if you plant them like right after wheat, but it's not something you plant in the fall. So that's one thing I would say with these tropical cover crops, these are things you're gonna use in the summer. They're not things you're gonna plant uh, in almost any situation in the fall because they're gonna be easily killed by frost and they're just not gonna get that much growth. But we look at summer mixes like green cover seed sells a lot of, um, they can certainly be part of the, the portfolio. Keith, what do you think? What Are there any summer cover crops? Yeah, you know, among the tropicals? Sure, sun, sun hemp is definitely, you know, leads the charge on all that. but. But you know, really, sorghum and millet are are really tropical plants too. They're they're very well adapted, you know, down closer to the equator. So we don't think of them as tropical plants because they're so commonly used here, uh, but they certainly are. You know, one that we experimented with last year and, and it was really kind of fun to see it grow because it just really got huge. Was a plant called Sesbania, and uh, it is another tropical legume. Got very large, had had big old woody stems, but uh, you know, really was a big plant. And uh, we were kind of excited about what we saw. I'm supposed to be getting a full pallet of that in this year from India. Uh, so if anybody wants to get a little bit of Sesbania and, and give it a try, you know, some people worry about some of these becoming a weed issue and, and they potentially could down in the South where they would grow long enough to make seed. But as you move North, like that Sesbania had barely just flowered before it froze out. We planted it in May. I mean, really long season. Sun hemp just will never make viable seed on any kind of consistent basis to ever become a weed issue up here. So, you know, you do have to be concerned about that sometimes bringing in some of these more exotic things. But, uh, you know, if we could produce seed on these, they would already be grown for seed in places. And they're not. We have to import those from other countries. So I really don't see that as being an issue. But it's fun to experiment with some of those. I know that in our grow room at our Iola location, Dale uh, is experimenting with uh, some velvet beans and scarlet runner beans and some of those. And they show great promise. Part of the issue, and, and, and Rob, this is one of the issues with Lab Lab too, is seed size is so large. You know, yeah. some of those things are like the size of a lima bean. They're just not gonna make, they're not gonna mix well with other things. That's why sun hemp is really nice. It's got a small seed size. Cisbania is a small seed size. So that's another thing that you have to kind of watch out for when looking at some of these is how can you get it through your drill? Yeah. Yeah. I've grown Scarlet Runner bean. It's not as vigorous as Lab Lab, but it, it does put on some growth. So Keith, you mentioned kind of an interesting point there um, about the fact that cover crops can often become a weed issue. Um, Rob, have you done any kind of studies as far as looking at the negative costs of cover crops when they become a weed as far as, is it just an extra chemical cost to terminate those or have you done any kind of research on that end? Well, I know what you're getting at, Noah, but I think I'll take a slight exception to saying cover crops become a weed. So when we talk about a weedy species, there are certain things we usually have. We have hard seed that allows them to germinate over multiple years. 
among our common cover crops, the only one that has that trait consistently is hairy vetch. I mean, there's actually an effort underway to develop what would be called soft seeded hairy vetch that would not germinate for multiple years in the soil. So most of our cover crops are what we would call true annuals. They're gonna uh, germinate at a particular time point. The seeds all gonna come up in one flush and that makes them pretty easy to knock out with tillage or with mowing or uh, with a herbicide, of course. Um, now the slight issue that can happen if you get a load of seed from just who knows where of cover crop seed that maybe hasn't been cleaned real well, yes, you could get some weed seed in that cover crop. And I think when we hear about a weed issue with cover crops, that's usually the problem is getting a batch of seed that has not been clean well, um, hasn't had the kind of quality standards that we'd like to see. But as far as the cover crop species themselves, I, I can't think of a single instance where I've heard somebody say that became a weedy problem. How about you, Keith? Is that something you hear about? Yeah, no, not long-term. I mean, you can have some issues with things like buckwheat or mustard, which, which bloom very quickly and readily make seed. You can have some volunteer issues that next year. They're typically pretty easy to control with management. Where, where you can get in trouble with that is in an organic situation where they, they can't take that out chemically and the timing just, you know, they can get, they can get rid of some of it through the timing, but not all of it. So, you know, we have to be a little careful sometimes about, you know, when do we put buckwheat in organic mixes, especially if they're coming in with wheat the next year, because that buckwheat would be making seed and would be harvested right with the wheat. That can be an advantage if you're trying to grow two things and you're separating them. And, and I have people that do that. Uh, it can be a disadvantage if that's going to make you take a dock when you're trying to sell, you know, your primary crop. Um, we see that once in a while with some of the perennials, you know, like chicory or some of those things that are really, really deep rooted perennials. Uh, they can be difficult to, to terminate and move on to the next thing. So we typically don't use those things. If, if somebody's just doing an annual cover cropping system, we would save those when, when they're doing a perennial setting and they want those plants to grow for, you know, four, five, six years. Uh, yeah. then they could be very beneficial. The perennials are definitely a different story. I've grown buckwheat probably 15 years in Missouri in rotation with corn and beans or other crops. And it, it, it can volunteer, but it's it's rarely an issue because it's it's pretty easy crop to knock out with a variety of beans. So. Yeah, and, and, and buckwheat is is really kind of an, an anomaly because it's it has no tolerance to cold weather. So first frost, it is dead. But yet it comes up in very cool soils. I mean, I've seen that buckwheat come up in probably 45 degree soils. Uh, Brendan Rocky out in Colorado, he, he plants buckwheat with his potatoes. So he's planting that stuff. You know, but those potatoes are planted four to five inches deep. And, and that stupid buckwheat comes right up. I told him, I said, no, you're wasting your money. You can't do that. And of course, he had to do it to prove me wrong. And he was right. It'll come up from very deep and in, in cool soils, which is kind of an anomaly for a plant that has no cold tolerance. So you almost always see flushes of buckwheat in the fall or the spring that will germinate in cool soils and, and then the frost takes them out. Um, all right, well, I think that'll conclude this evening's uh, webinar. Thank you so much for your time, Rob and Keith, both You're of welcome. you guys. Um, like I said, for those who missed the beginning, next week we're gonna have Keith and Dale on as basically just a, frequently asked questions you guys can come on and ask them any questions that ask you guys have you we'll stump we'll stump dale for sure Let's yeah look. there you go <laughs> so uh excited for that thank you again rob do you have any final thoughts for us before we let you go no watch that movie living soil if you haven't seen it it's got not just keith's farm but some all across the country although keith is probably the star of the film so <laughs> you <should> enjoy it. <laughs> but you should watch it in spite of that <laughs> you can fast forward through keys. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's good. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. We'll see you all next week. And thank you all. We'll see you then. Okay. Bye. Good night.